Hello, and welcome to Nordic Notes. I'm Reid. I'm Daniel. And today we are joined by our colleague Eira to talk about an area that the Nordics is a world leader in. Yeah. So, hi everyone. I'm Eira. I'm an analyst here at Luminar. And when I started at Luminar, I started looking into climate tech. Obviously, that's very broad, so focused in pretty quickly on the energy markets. And with that comes the power grid and the power system and batteries and everything in between there. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Let's jump right in. Okay, so starting off with where investments will go and the magnitude of all this. We know that the electrification will have a very big impact on everything from logistics and transport, mobility, industries, and everything in between. But for now, we're going to be focusing majority on the power grid and the renewable sector. So if we're seeing here the European Union, if we want to be on track to reach net zero by 2050, Already in 2030, we're going to see $1.7 trillion of investments going into a few different buckets, with the four buckets here on the screen being the largest ones. So electricity generation from renewables is going to be a very big chunk of it, but then also into the distrib distribution grid, but also the digital solutions for the grid. So just quickly mentioning how the grid works. Producers produce energy. It goes through the transmission system into a substation, which kind of lowers the voltage from the transmission system down to the distribution system. So this is the distribution grid that we're talking about, which can be divided into regional and local, but that's where we have players such as Eon and Vattenfall being the grid operators, but then also the electricity trading companies. And for the distribution grid, obviously a lot of the investments are gonna go into hardware, and that might be a little more out of scope for us, but then we have so many different companies focusing on software solutions, so specifically for making it more effective. So not only are we going to have to build out the, like the infrastructure, the actual power lines that you see everywhere, but we're also going to have to increase the output of the distribution grid. So that's where I think a lot of the investments are going to go to companies solving the congestion problems and the forecasting and the efficiency of just the actual electrons traveling throughout the distribution grid. And how does that break down between national grids and this massive interconnected European grid system? Is it going to look the same in every country or how, how is this being regulated across Europe? Yeah, so I would say how the grid works, it's mainly the same in all the different European countries, but then when it comes to regulations and who oversees everything, especially on the regulation side, it's very different. But then for all of the European countries, we have the transmission system operator, which is Svenska Kraftnät in Sweden. But then we have other TCOs for the different European markets. TCO, so transmission. System operator. I see. So that's the one overseeing the transmission grid. And that's only one for each country. But then when we go down to the distribution grids, you have a lot of different distribution system operators. And that's the same in all the European countries. You have very many of them. In Sweden, we have 170, uh, but then we have five accounting for almost 80, 90% of the grid and then very many smaller ones. And the size of this is obviously huge. I mean, $140 billion needs to be invested or euros. And it says here the electricity generation from renewables. Mm. Is that the main focus when it comes to the European electricity supply or are there pockets in there for the other different type of technologies like nuclear and others? Yeah, so I think what we're seeing, the largest chunk of this is going into wind and solar. And then we have hydro in Sweden, which accounts for majority of the base load here and the other type of technologies there. But definitely majority investments are going into solar and wind. And now we're also seeing a big uptick in batteries, which I'm sure none of you guys have missed that are listening to this. But batteries are going to account for also a very big chunk, both because solar and wind are intermittent energy sources so it's always been about or now it's going to be a lot about stability because the grid has always been able to provide electricity but now with so much intermittency it's going to be hard to forecast when and where this is going to go and that's why we need a lot in the battery space as well so and that intermittency obviously is because of the weather itself yeah. fundamentally so there's nothing you can do to solve that yeah. other than building big storage systems it's yeah. what the households in the entire europe basically have experienced in the last couple of years yeah. and it's expected to 
to, to continue. Now there's a few solutions coming out for home batteries, which are going to obviously help the households be able to control their own electricity consumption and kind of the forecast and measure and uh, make it more efficient, but then also for a lot of grid scale solutions. So we have a few hundred megawatts being built out now, and there's going to be a few gigawatts being built out in the next coming years. And just to, obviously the price kind of curves and the cost curves for solar and wind has gone down dramatically in the last couple of years. And that's why we're seeing it be such a big source of investments going into that today as well. But we're still seeing the investments in that increase significantly, but then batteries are more up and coming and the cost curve is still pretty pricey. So the amount of money that's going to have to be poured into this from different actors is um, yeah, it's astounding. And those actors primarily are governments or? Yeah, so we're seeing actually a lot as with solar and wind, majority of investments in solar and wind was from private actors. So we're going to, I believe we're going to see the same in the battery space as well. It's going to be a lot of private actors, but then obviously subsidies for the home batteries from the governments. But for the grid scale, I believe it's going to be a lot of the, the Infrastructure funds. And, yeah. yeah infrastructure funds and similar, because also a big part of this is obviously the revenue that can come from it. And it's, I think most people have seen that there is this, what we call the gold rush uh, towards battery storage mm -hmm. and grid balancing. Uh, and I think that's sort of self-explanatory, but the the fact that the grid needs to, to be able to operate at all times, regardless if there is wind or if there is uh, sun. Certainly in the northern part of Europe, you'll see less of the sun, but quite a bit of wind. And you need batteries to, to balance this and make it more stable. So maybe let's move into that. So the gold rush that we mentioned before with all of these investments going into batteries and the build out of all these grid scale capacity, obviously now with a lot more intermittency, we need this. And the case and the ROI for these batteries have been very good in the last few years and are probably going to continue for the next one, two years. But it's very unsure how this market will continue to evolve. So if we look at the graphs here, you can all see that they're going down very quickly and fairly dramatically. So now when we're seeing so much batteries, what we're talking about is the capacity that they have and how much they can play a part in stabilizing the grid. So now there's been a massive, we've had too little capacity or effect to balance all the fluctuations. So that's why prices have been high and revenue has been high for these batteries when it comes to stabilizing the grid. But now the market is going to be saturated. So that's because why that revenue is going to degrade. Yeah, yeah. degrade. So and if you set up a battery park today, purely in order balancing. to balance the grid and make money off of that, yeah. you're going to see the price that you'll sell the energy or go down over time. There are also other devices out there, and there's a lot of talks about that in terms of using other devices to balance the grid. And it can also be done by, as you mm. mentioned, different ways. You can also cut off the energy to a certain system. You can use water. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you can also, yeah. you can stop charging your car. That's one mm. way of balancing the grid, Yeah, obviously. So it's not only the whole, the actual selling to the grid, which is the battery parks and the rest are doing. Yeah. But this is then, what we're seeing here is the decline in the price that you, you'll get paid exactly. for, for doing that. Exactly. And I think that's a good point because we have been balancing the grid for a long time, but historically we've been balancing it with hydro, but that's a pretty, it takes longer to turn on and off hydro. So we can't balance the grid as quickly as we need it. So like the dispatch time for hydro is way longer, uh, mm -hmm. but for batteries, it can work in an instant. So that's why this is very attractive right now as well, because the changes that we see in the, uh, the real time markets for balancing, you're gonna have to need um, to dispatch this capacity or effect very, very quickly. We kind of need to do all of it, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we there's, no, there's no getting <laughs> around it. Yeah, if we want yeah. to be fossil free in Europe, we will need all of these technologies yeah. uh, for sure. to work well together. And, and, and to deploy these $140 billion as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, exactly. And maybe now is Brilliant. a good time to talk about some of the companies that we've seen operating in and around this space in different capacities. And you've put together this really excellent market map here we can take a look at. Yeah, so the FTM and the BTM stands for front of the meter and behind the meter. These are majority Nordic companies and a few European ones, but it's all Europe and majority of them are Nordic, yes. And that's also a good point. Like we're so far ahead in the Nordics when it comes to this. So majority of the companies are actually operating in the Nordics now, but then we're also going to be talking a bit about the EU and the interconnected grid and how everything is going to be working together. To point to a specific policy or, or regulation that has led to the Nordics 
being this sort of world leader and as you say sort of here are all the companies that we think are relevant to this space in Europe and we're seeing a majority of them out of this region why do you think that is I think we were very, like our government and our state, we were very early on having subsidies for this and putting a lot of money into the renewable space. And we're also in a good geographical position where there is a lot of wind. We have a lot of hydro compared to other countries. Um, so that's why we're ahead of the curve when it comes to fossil versus uh, renewables in our grid mix. Okay, so when we look at this space, we kind of divide it into both hardware and software and then the buckets that I talked about before. So more of the use case. And obviously where... I believe the software is behind you. Right, oh, yeah. right behind you. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is the software bucket. Yeah, and then um, also to mention the grid actors, those are all software players. So that's why that little line is there. But... Um, interesting when we're looking at hardware, then obviously it's going to be more about building out the grid, but also the batteries. And another large area here that we're looking at are second life batteries. And that's why some of the companies like Rebaba and Wolftang are all up here. Uh, so they basically take old EV batteries and repurpose them. And I think in general, this is going to be a very, very interesting space because you're hearing EV adoption grew massively the last 10 years. And then we're going to have to use all of those batteries for new purposes and actually reused or repurposed EV batteries are very good for balancing the grid because by the end of their lifetime when they're efficient in cars they still have 80% of their capacity left. So they put them into a container basically and put basically, them out somewhere yeah. to just yeah. store energy or balance the grid. Yeah exactly so that we're talking about with the grid scale you can put them up in so you can put all these old EV batteries in a container, you can set them up by a solar park or a wind park or a hydro or whatever it might be. Uh, you store the energy and then you can save it for later dispatch to the grid. I saw yeah. yesterday actually, and this is sort of somewhat related, that uh, Tim Cook was saying that the new Apple Watch is using all recycled yeah. materials for, for their battery and all of the wiring. So yeah. definitely becoming, I would say, even outside of regulated uh, jurisdictions like yeah. in the US where they can just choose that this might be the most efficient yeah. way to, to, to build new batteries. I think yeah. also to so reuse the batteries is one thing, putting them into these containers and have them live their second life. Mm. I think the recycling has come quite far as well. So I read that Fortum, one of the Finnish companies, also active here in Sweden and the Nordics, they are now at roughly 85% or something of the, all the materials in a battery is being uh, recycled. Mm. So I think that is running in parallel with this trend of reusing the batteries. Mm. And obviously in the end, at some point, all batteries will be done and yeah. they will hopefully then be able to recycle them also at the end of that second or third life yeah. or how many ever life they, they might have. I also very much want to mention the, both the grid actors, but then also the utility scale companies. So we recently saw a large round with Fever from General Catalyst and what they're doing is like an API enabler to the balancing markets for producers. So you can be able to trade on the balancing markets if you connect to them for all the EU markets, I yeah. I believe. But and it's one of the bottlenecks, right? Yeah. To, to actually get to connect to the grid. Yeah. It's not that easy. To no. not, just, not anyone can connect to the grid and start selling into the grid. Yeah. So they're helping them with that. Yeah. Yeah, and there you can also take the place as an aggregator, which we see, I think I'm covering, or Daniel is actually covering them now, like Checkwell, which yeah. became a big, big sensation here in Sweden, being an aggregator of uh, distributed energy resources. So whether it be um, EV chargers, EVs, or batteries and... Um, Checkwell out of Gothenburg. Yes, out of Gothenburg. So let's move over to the what's happening outside of the big exchanges and uh, platforms where there is a... A lot of companies becoming different types of energy providers, setting mm. up solar parks and battery farms and all of that. And um, we can start this by just quickly breaking down the wholesale market and the balancing market, as you can call it. So what we're seeing a lot today is a lot of the trade, like the physical trade of energy is going through the Swedish spot markets and, or the Nordic spot market, I would say, in the Baltics, which is Nordpot. So if you have a producer, they know they're going to produce a certain amount of energy, they sell it to the electricity trading company and other actors, and all of this trade is happening on the day ahead market and the intraday market. So this is like the physical, actual physical trading of electricity. But what we're also seeing is new developments within where electricity is traded. So we're seeing new markets and also exchanges, both for the flexibility services, 
but also for the actual physical trading of electricity. So this is a space we've been looking into called the kind of the power purchase agreement space of the PPA market, which is basically now if a producer wants to sell energy, they don't necessarily have to go via node pool to reach the end consumer or the industry or whoever the end consumer might be. They can go directly from producer to the end consumer. So this is taking away a large chunk of the value chain that we're seeing today. So the traders and the balancing service providers and all of those actors are also going to have a role in this. But this has been, the PPA market has usually been closed off to kind of the mid segment. So it's the big companies like Microsoft, Google, they're making commitments to just have renewable energy. So they would make, uh, they would sign a long contract with an IPP, which is an independent power producer, which could be a wind farm or a solar farm. Microsoft says, we need this much electricity over the next coming years. The solar park says, nice, now we can go with this to the bank. We have a secure revenue stream for the next couple of years. So a big bottleneck in this transition that we're seeing is the financing for new parks or for batteries or whatever it might be, new technology that will help this transition. So this PPA market, we think, will definitely act as a key to open up the financing for more, for more of these inventions and innovations. And also what we're seeing is this market has been closed off to the larger players. So Microsoft, Google, whoever it might be, they have a lot of purchasing power and they have the budget to invest in this. But for smaller players who also wants to help put more renewables onto the grid and connect to the grid, this has been closed for them because it's so expensive. The PPA structure is very complicated and very long. So you need lawyers, you need someone to go through the documents, you need a lot of help with this and everyone doesn't have the budget for that. But now it's also an interesting play where you can aggregate the demand from smaller players and then make this whole transition a bit more efficient and structured so you can open up the market to more players. I think this is really interesting, this slide that you've put together here on how the European grid is being put together. And and this was what I was alluding to earlier when I asked you about the European sort of regulatory oversight and, and their sort of power, I guess, coming from Brussels in some sense, versus the national grids who obviously have operated this historically in many ways independent from each other. And I think the reasons why countries like Sweden or the Norway, I think to some extent at least, are experiencing these fluctuations in prices because we obviously, we ship our electricity to other countries. Yeah. This is known by many, but I think this map is really good to show that actually electricity is definitely flowing between these countries. So different things happening in different countries, like, such as Germany having a problem sourcing all of the gas yeah. need for the winter that affects everyone else in the grid. Yeah, so the Nordic grid is interconnected and have been for a pretty long time. But then if we're looking more into the EU grid, we already have, as it says on the side, 400 interconnections between the different systems across the different countries. But the EU is advocating very hard to make these interconnections even more and to have one aligned grid in Europe, except for multiple small ones operating by themselves. So how this is working today is that the TSO, so the Transmission System Operator, which is Svenska Kraftnät, in, they, together with the other 38 TCOs across the European region, they send the surplus of capacity that they have by the end of the day before the market opens up the next day. They send it to a market coupling operator mm -hmm. and then they divide it up onto the different power exchanges. So currently there's not really a lot of communication between the different TCOs, but it goes via a kind of shared interface or mm -hmm. acts as an interface toward the different power exchanges. And that's how the energy is where electricity is spread out across the EU. I think this is a very, very uh, you know, useful overview, Aira. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. And I think it's something where obviously we at Luminar and many other VCs across Europe, particularly obviously here in the Nordics, are very focused on finding startups and experienced entrepreneurs who understand the problems in this space and who are building solutions. I mean, you mentioned earlier, of course, that some hardware may be beyond our scope, but actually in this space, I think we're quite willing to 
look at anything and everything that can solve some of the major challenges uh, that we've mentioned in, yeah. in this episode. So if you're building a, a company that's addressing any of these challenges and doing it with software or with hardware, please get in touch. We'd love to meet you uh, and hear about uh, what you're building to, to solve the most important problem facing humanity uh, in the 21st century. So thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel to get more content from Luminar. Thank you so much and see you next time.